Hello and welcome to another Arsecast Extra as always with James from Gunner Blog. James, good morning to you. Good morning, Andrew. How are you? I'm good. Should it should it be a goodly morning? Do you know what? I was thinking that. I think it probably is on balance. Yeah. Uh, it's been a good week for Arsenal. A good a good week, a good transfer window thus far, and of course, a fairly substantial arrival over the weekend, which of course shocked and surprised everybody because, you know, we had no idea what was happening. It's nice when these signings come out of nowhere, isn't it? Out of the blue. Out of the blue. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, finally, uh, everyone can... Breathe a little easier. We have actually signed Declan Rice and Jurian Timber, lest we forget. Yes. Whose, whose announcement, you know, was somewhat overshadowed by the guy who cost more than double his transfer fee, but is still a big signing in his own right. Yeah. I mean, I don't suppose he'd be too uh, worried about that kind of thing, you know? Uh, the job is the job. The fact that we've signed Declan Rice um and announced it the the following day it does overshadow him a little bit but i don't think he's going to be sitting in in america right now crying worried <laughs> about about how his moment in the sun was uh, was taken by big deck yeah they just don't get on from now on you know <laughs> he's forever bearing a grudge no i think he'll be okay and obviously that was the timing that was the deadline that the club had right was a plane departing uh, to the us well, I mean, that does tend to focus the mind. You know, if you've got mm. travel plans, you need to you need to be in a certain place at a certain time. Um, look, just good to, to get it done. And obviously, there's plenty to talk about when it comes to Declan Rice, the signing, the fee, what it means and all the rest. But the most important thing that we have to begin with is Declan Rice's foot knuckles or mm. fuckles, as I so... Um, carelessly overlooked last week. I watched the video of Declan's first day at Arsenal. Yeah. They're good. I like these. I like the 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 way they did it for Jury and Timber and also for Declan Rice. I think, you know, maybe we can talk about this in, in a little bit is is the sort of uh holistic sounds like a bit of a wanky word, but you know, the involvement of everybody from Edu picking up Timber at the airport, the family getting everybody involved. They brought in Per Mertesacker, Jack Wilshire, you know, it's like this is a family club, as Mikel Arteta spoke about. Um, you know, when he was introducing the players, welcome to the family and all that. And and they're they're good videos, they're interesting. But Declan Rice was doing some uh, some stuff in the gym. Mm. And there was a moment where he just jumped up in the air mm -hmm. and he jumped really high. I don't know if they put like a little bit of slow-mo on it or whatever it was. And all I could think about was what you were talking about last week with the, with the feet and the toes that maybe he's got these special toes that allow him to jump higher than, than other people, than mere mortals. And perhaps that is a reason why Arsenal have decided to spend 105 million pounds on one footballer. Well, indeed, a lot of people have questioned the fee, but I think amid that debate, they may have overlooked his toe knuckles and yeah. how heavily they may have weighed in any negotiations. Yes. You know, West Ham probably asked to keep them, to <laughs> use them on another player after some sort of transplant operation. Yeah, yeah. But uh, Arsenal weren't having any of it. You know, they wanted... They wanted Declan knuckles and all, toe yeah. knuckles and all. So, yeah, I mean, it's good to see this behind the scenes kind of detail stuff that we don't normally get. Yeah. Um, knuckle information, essentially. Yeah. He did jump really high, didn't he? He's good at jumping high. Uh, that, I, you know, that was probably high on Arsenal's list. I mean, it's, it is genuinely quite a useful trait in football, isn't it? You uh -huh. know, you can, uh, if you're dribbling towards goal, an opposition defender is charging at you, jump clean over them, for example. <laughs> uh, we're going to see Declan Rice reenact the Canu Wiltord moment uh, yeah. at Old Trafford, but actually the person will be standing up when he jumps over them, not on their knees celebrating. Yes, and it won't be a celebration. It'll be in-game. Um, he'll, he'll do it <laughs> to get to a header from a corner, like literally go over someone's shoulders. Sure. I'm looking forward to it all. Um the except peace coach is going to have a field day with that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what new developments, tactical developments, are we going to see from Mikel Arteta's team? <laughs> Just you fucking wait, guys. Yeah. Wait till you see what's about Leap to Leapfrogs mainly. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, where do you want to start with this? Because, you know, it's it's one of those where because it's been in the 
in the washing machine for so long or in the post for so long. Why would it be in the washing machine? I don't know. But we've been waiting for this package to arrive for a long time, and now it's here. Yeah. And I don't think really there is a, you know, it's underwhelming or anything like it because it's not. It's really exciting. But I think we've spent so long getting used to it that it's maybe easy to overlook quite what a big deal this is. Um, financially, what it says about the stature of the club, what it says about the the team we're building, the manager, all of all of those kinds of things. So, I mean, where do you think is a good place to start on this? I mean, do we go back in time a little bit to, you know, maybe earlier this season, late last year, when Arsenal started the groundwork uh, on this kind of on this signing? I should say, you know, maybe a year ago it would have been impossible to convince anyone that this is the kind of deal that we could do. Absolutely. And, and Arsenal have liked Declan Rice for a long, long time, you know, uh, probably years, uh, but were never massively seen as a, a front runner. I think everybody assumed that Chelsea was his eventual destination, that he'd go back there. They had mm. an owner and managers who really liked him. And Arsenal, I don't think, was seen as kind of a credible home for Declan Rice. It was really interesting, actually, going back to January when the story broke. I actually had a look over the weekend at some of the replies and some of the tweets and some of the mentions. And there was uh, a mixture of kind of incredulity and annoyance at the link because <laughs> people people either thought, well, this is pure PR. You know, we've just missed out on Mudrick. Mm. Um, now we're being fed this guff about Declan Rice uh, and here we are you know a few months later on and he's sitting there in the Arsenal shirt I think one of the reasons this is interesting is it, it genuinely puts um, a timeline on how long these big big deals can be yeah. in the making you know if you think about Jude Bellingham for example this summer he's gone to Real Madrid that was a deal years in the making and years in the wooing. And I think uh, in the case of Declan Rice, you're probably looking at at least around a year in terms of how long Arsenal have been working on this, planning for it, trying to make it happen. Uh, and it just, I, I suppose it, it, it sort of lays bare a little bit the importance of having continuity, a plan, um, keeping people in position so that they can actually follow through on the strategy. Sure. And, yeah, how much work it takes. I mean, it tells you how far we've come that we were able to get this deal done, that he wanted to come here and that we were able to pay up. It's just a massive signing. I mean, you know, you think about where it sits alongside other signings in Arsenal's recent history. Um, it's right up there, I think, with your Sol Campbell's, perhaps even, you know, your Mesut Ozil's, maybe even your Dennis Bergkamp's, not in terms of necessarily the type of player or quality of player, but I think in terms of the statement that it makes about where we are as a club right now. I think that's, I think that's true, you know, because Arsenal have seen off some big competitors for Declan Rice. Bayern Munich, Manchester City, people might uh, have some questions about how serious the interest was, but... You know, Manchester City don't bid that amount of money for players just for fun or, or anything like it, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And I do think it is a, it's a huge statement about what's happening at the club from top to bottom, right? That there is a, a joined up strategy, joined up thinking. There's incremental progress in terms of the caliber of players that we are bringing in they're getting better and better and bigger and bigger and also more expensive i mean what do you think was the process when they're having these discussions about you know what do we do next how do we reshape our midfield who are we going to target yeah pardon the uh, intrusion here but when Mikel Arteta and Edu and whoever else went to the board and went to the owners and said, look, this is what we want to do. How much convincing do you think it took for KSE to then turn around and go, let's do this? <laughs> I would imagine quite a bit because mm. it's a vast amount of money. Um, 
and I think we were talking last week, I think one of Edu and Arteta's primary skills is that they they seem to be able to persuade the board and the ownership to part with big sums of money. And as fans, I think that's something we should be pretty happy about. Um, I think, I mean, look, they, they knew looking at the age profile of the squad that Thomas Partey and Granit Xhaka have absolutely been the heart of the midfield. Are also probably among the oldest outfield mm. players in the squad. Certainly, the oldest starters, and you know, probably are reaching the end of their peak. You know, the time when they can be said to be at their their best. Um, and so, I suppose the case they made will have been partly about Rice's quality on the pitch, which, if you break down the numbers, speaks for itself. Particularly mm-hmm. defensively, I think he's outstanding in that respect. Um, but also there will have been factors like his personality, his nationality, his suitability to the league. I mean, this has been such a trend under Mikel Arteta, right? Signing Premier League proven players. He's done it again here. So they will have probably made the case that this is in some respects, uh, if not a sure thing, it comes with more guarantees than certain mm. other deals. Um and I think maybe as well, part of that dialogue may have been, you know, this is a step we need to take as a club. We've been close under Arteta to some pretty big signings or tried at least to make some. You think of the likes of you know, Vlavic we went after and Mudrik we were very close to. This is probably, in terms of the symbolism, a bigger deal uh, than either of those would have been. Sure. I think for Arsenal to sign an England international in their prime, coming into their prime from another Premier League team at that sort of cost puts us in a different place as a club. Uh, It's it's something I never really was certain we would see. You know, if you'd asked me if I could imagine, if you'd come to me two or three years ago and said, Arsenal are going to spend £100 million on England starting holding midfield player, I think I would have found that difficult to swallow. So... Uh, it, it is quite amazing the trajectory we are, we've been on and the speed of the turnaround. And I'm just really excited now. Even little things, you know, I, I, you saw the video about his first day and yeah. he got the treatment of going to Emirates Stadium, right, and being led out of the tunnel and mm-hmm. shown the pitch and, and all that aspect of it. Yeah. Um, and even him sort of marvelling at the stadium and saying, you know, I can't wait to play here. Mm. I kind of felt like two or three years ago, I'm not sure a player coming from another Premier League club would necessarily feel that way about the Emirates Stadium, but it has become a really special place to play football and to go and watch football. And he clearly feels that. So Mm. that good feeling that is kind of extending through all aspects of the club is making an impact and is helping sway decisions now. And that's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, the the thing that came across to me from watching the first interview he did and then the video of the first day was just how much he is into it. Mm -hmm. You know, he's obviously got a huge connection with West Ham and I'm, I'm certain that that won't ever change for him. Um, you know, the West Ham fans, some of them I'm sure will have a different opinion. That's just the way football fandom works. And we've talked about that a little bit, but I don't think his connection with West Ham will ever be shaken because he spent so many years there and, you know, you can love two football clubs or you can love more than one football club. That's just kind of uh, the reality that, that players exist in, even if we don't really care for that as as fans. But his excitement about joining Arsenal, the history of Arsenal, the stadium, as you say, wore a nice suit to go out on the pitch with uh, Arteta and Edu, um, that really came across, didn't it? Just his, he's chomping at the bit to be part of what's going on at Arsenal right now. And, you know, the conversations that happened in the background to make this deal go through or to make him convinced this was the place to be. I mean, you'd love to be a fly on, on the wall, but, but, I suppose you have to um, talk about Mikel Arteta in that sense as well, that everything you read, everything you hear, you know, he is a, an extremely compelling man and convincing man 
um, in, in conversations like this, where he is telling you, this is what I want. This is my vision for you, for the club. Uh, he's been, you know, you, you again, think back to his first interview with Arsenal, where he was absolutely clear about what he wanted. And, you know, doing it is a, is another thing, but, but the clarity of what he said he wanted to do was present in that first interview. And that was his first ever interview as a football manager. I think he's learned a lot and developed, you know, into the job and, and, uh, all the rest of it over the three and a half years, whatever it is that he's been in charge now. But from the very start, that was part of who he was. And I think that aspect of of getting a deal like this done is is important to acknowledge as well yeah i say this with the greatest respect but he Mikel Arteta seems like a man who probably practices those uh, conversations in the car you know i i feel like <laughs> he never goes into a meeting not quite sure of what he's going to say and we had a manager for years in arsene wenger who many players would arrive at arsenal and say well i came here to work with him yeah um and i think we are starting to see a similar trend emerge with Mikel Arteta. I think that credit to Edu, to uh, Rich Garlic, to the board, to the owners for getting this deal over line. Mm. But I think the single biggest factor in it has been Mikel Arteta. And he has been uh, agitating and working on this on, without exaggeration, a daily basis, really, for mm. a long time. And, and working at both ends of the deal, you know, um, his conversations with the player have been critical, but also internally, as we say, persuading the board, persuading the club to go the extra mile that was required. Um, who knows? Maybe even trying to talk Pep out of it. <laughs> that must have been an interesting <laughs> conversation between those two uh, about what exactly was going on with Rice. Fuck off. But, yeah, <laughs> something like that. Fuck something off. Like that. <laughs> and then in terms of his pitch to the player, I think the the really exciting thing is, look, they did all the things you would expect Arsenal to do for an individual. So there was a massive presentation and dossier of, you know, this is what we think about you as a player. This is why we love you. This is how you fit. This is how you can improve. But there was another part to what Rice was presented with, which was about, and this is where Arsenal are going. Mm. This is where Arsenal are going to be. This is where we project into the future. This is what we're looking to achieve in the next few years. And then it puts the bullet ball in his court, you know, do you want to be part of that? And from the bits and pieces I've heard throughout the process, he very much did. And and Arsenal had his commitment pretty early on because he was, you know, he was excited. Josh Kroenke would be very happy. Declan Rice was very, very excited. Mm. Um, and that's great because it shows you that it's not just about the plan for the individual. It's the thing of, look, look we're going here. Are you on board? Mm. And uh, the fact that he felt he couldn't, you know, let this opportunity pass him by is really encouraging. And I'm just excited now. I'm excited to see him on the pitch. I'm excited for the next uh, the next steps, really. And and seeing, you know, we, we've all read everywhere that he's sort of integral to the Arteta tactical puzzle. Yeah. Well, now I want to see that start to sort of piece together on the pitch. Yeah, I mean, we talked about this a bit, you know, over the last couple of weeks is the the fact that he was the the cornerstone of this transfer window. Mm -hmm. That the, so much depended on him. Um, I think you said last week or the week before that, like, if you don't get Declan Rice, what do you do? Where do you go? You obviously have to pivot to something else, but there isn't really another Declan Rice out there at this moment in time you know, available yeah. on the market, style of player, caliber of player, um, you know, all, all of the factors that, that uh, we've mentioned. It was so important to get this done. And I think it's one of those that when the deal or the interest, I should say, became public knowledge, whatever it was six months ago, right? I think that adds another layer to, to the whole thing. Because, like you said, there was a mixture of incredulity and annoyance. It's like, oh, yeah, come on, Declan Rice. Why would he go to Arsenal? You know, Arsenal couldn't afford him. Arsenal won't be attractive to him. All of those things. And you can understand why people had doubts. It's not that. But this, this whole thing playing out in public the way it did, 
and becoming more and more intense and acute as time went on. There was a, there's an element of pressure on the club, on the manager, on Edu, on the owners to get this deal across the line because we've missed out on a couple of key targets in the last couple of windows where it just hasn't quite gone the way we wanted and we've reacted well enough. That's fine. But something like this, if it's, if it's in the ether for so long and you don't get it done, I think it would reflect, it would cause a lot of questions, wouldn't it? Um, you know, we, we, we can talk positively about the perception of Arsenal now that Declan Rice is across the line. Uh, and what it says about us and what it says about the manager, what it says about the direction and all that. But if you hadn't got it done, it's sort of like a, a crack in the facade, if you like. Yes, I, I know what you mean. I think one of the co- sort of outstanding um, f- outstanding points on kind of the checklist of, you know, what have we achieved? Where are we going? Uh, was, you know, can we pull off the mega deal? Mm. Um uh, and I think we have shown that we can now. It, it's. I agree with you about it being public. It's one of the reasons I always sort of slightly laugh when people say, oh, the club are just leaking their transfer targets again. Mm. Because in in most cases, that is not something a club would want to do. Um, because it, it does, you know, make things a little bit more difficult at times and certainly invites competition. If Arsenal had lost out on Declan Rice to Man City, I don't think that would have been quite as damning as some might suggest, just because it's Man City and we have to be realistic about what we're up against and competing with sometimes. But the fact that we did complete it in spite of competition from City is nonetheless massive. You know, I I think... I think had it not gone our way, uh, we, there's a certain you know we would have had to slightly shrug our shoulders and say, well, it's City. What can you do? The fact that it has gone our way feels pretty significant. And can I ask you, you know, something about that? Sorry. Yeah, of course. Just, of course. Just to sort of um, because you know we we had a conversation on here a few weeks ago when the City interest became public, right? Mm-hmm. And would it be fair to say that we no we're anxious but you know you 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 face the reality of who city are what they do um how successful they are and and you have to take into account that it could be a very very attractive move for Declan Rice and I think that's basically what we said like if he chooses to go there you know what can you do because they've got this track record and you're almost guaranteed trophies and all that kind of stuff yeah but maybe I'm misremembering here But it feels to me anyway, like City's circling of Declan Rice faded away pretty quickly. Do you think that was because he was absolutely committed to joining Arsenal, absolutely convinced that this was the right move despite interest from Manchester City? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, my understanding is that when City were in dialogue with West Ham, West Ham were kind of telling them, well, you might be wasting your time because from what we hear, he's going to Arsenal. Um, and that's his preference. Now, City may have interpreted that as a negotiation tactic. You know, mm. they might have just said, well, that's, you know, it could have been a way of West Ham just trying to make sure they put a really tasty offer in. Uh, but West Ham, throughout this process, and you've seen this, you know, there's various like West Ham ITK folk online who've, who've followed <laughs> the same narrative. But it, it is correct that throughout these negotiation, negotiations sorry, with all clubs, West Ham have been firmly of the belief that Declan Rice's preference was Arsenal. Mm. And I, I, I know that City's interest faded away. I personally think that they didn't get the assurances they needed from Declan Rice. I think if Declan Rice had said, it's City, I'm 100% committed to it, then I think City would have felt, well, we can get a deal done with West Ham. Um, But when it became clear that the player's preference was for Arsenal, it became a one-horse race. And it's interesting, Arsenal came in pretty high with that 105 offer. And I think that was probably partly informed by where Man City had come in and wanting to take them out of the competition. 
And it worked as well. That's an important thing to say. I mean, Arsenal behaved in a pretty emphatic way. They didn't come in... You know, I read stories of Arsenal low-balling West Ham here and there. Well, maybe so on the first offer. But by the time they came in at 105, they were coming in well above their previous offer, well above what City had done. And it was effectively a number that closed the deal. I know there was another Mm. week, 10 days, maybe even more of sort of finalising it. But from that point on, no one had an answer to it. And, you know, that was big boy stuff for Arsenal to come down and put that amount of money on the table. Um, And it was, you know, we, we talk about acting like a big club. Well, that's absolutely what Arsenal did in that instance. Let's talk about the fee for a minute then, because, you know, while yeah. we're in this ballpark, you know, £100 million for a footballer, it's a transfer record for a uh, an English slash Irish player. Um, you know, £105 million with add-ons, £5 million add-ons, maybe they get all of that or, or maybe they don't. It's worth saying it's only £10.5 million per toe knuckle, if you want to break it down. Well, I mean, that's a bargain. That is yeah. a bargain, you know. For when you look at it like that, yeah. For for a guy with with fuckles like his, um, <laughs> it's uh, it's it's really good value. But how do you view it? You know, the, I suppose when you step back from it objectively, it's like it's absurd. It's a ludicrous amount of money, but within the context of football, it's it's more understandable. Um, I said this in the the podcast we did on on Patreon, the new player podcast but also in the in the blog yesterday. So if five years ago, Liverpool are paying £75 million for Virgil van Dijk, who was a 26-year-old Dutch international, Arsenal paying £100 million for Declan Rice in 2023, who's a 24-year-old England international, you know, it, you can't always put deals side by side, but I do think there are some parallels between these two deals. And I think in that context, it's it makes a lot more sense. Mm. Yeah. And, I, you know, I gather there's some inflation happening in the world mm. right now. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm certain it wasn't intended. But the way uh, you said Dutch then, uh, really, there was a like, <laughs> it really looked, sounded like you were looking down your nose at the people of the Netherlands. My, if I, I, <laughs> a 26 year Dutch international. <laughs> My apologies. I did not uh, mean to throw any shade at the good people of the Netherlands. I just, I just was trying to emphasize yeah. the point I was making about no, you know I- the English, <laughs> the English tags. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I got it. I got it. It was funny. See, because we just uh, signed a Dutch international as well. That'd be that'd be very harsh. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a real. I mean, look, it's a huge amount of money, and I think English tax, Premier League tax, uh, both apply here um and bear in mind as well a competitor was involved you know if Mm. if man city don't get involved for declan rice do we end up paying a lower fee i i would imagine so not by 20 or 30 million but maybe by 10 million or so um Mm. i would think or you know but west ham were quite insistent about that 100 number so sure maybe we would have had to get there in the end i think what's interesting about this number and this player is I think it's going to be quite hard to assess him by it. So if you spend £100 million on a striker, you know how he's going to be assessed. It's going to be goals. Mm. And if you spend £100 million on a goalkeeper or £70 or £80 million on Kepa, for example, and they chuck a few in, you know how that is going to be sure. interpreted or assessed. I even think with centre halves, I think about Harry Maguire, for example, it's slightly easier to assess because you know a mistake from a centre half can be so critical that, um, and a clean sheet equally is so measurable mm. that there's a kind of a clear sort of metric system for that. For a, for a central midfield player, uh, and one who's not expected to contribute, you know, fifteen goal and assists every year. I think it's genuinely going to be quite hard to measure. And to be honest, that may be a good thing for Declan Rice because it probably is an overpay of some description and he's not going to have it round his neck in the way I think certain players who operate in other positions might. I don't know if that makes any sense. It does, yeah. I mean, 
I, I don't think the fee, he doesn't strike me as the kind of guy who's going to be uh, fretting about the amount of money that Arsenal paid for him. You yeah. know, he, he, he looks a really confident guy, doesn't he? The way he came into the club, um, met the dog, met Win the dog, of course. Yeah. Um, it's brilliant, isn't it? All these footballers who just, uh, you know, they come in, they're talking, and, they're, uh, and then it's like, oh, win! <laughs> they all get these little high-pitched wins. Um, I, I think he, he even says in the video, I've heard everyone's been trying to take her home uh, every night with them. So, yeah, she's obviously a, a popular figure at Arsenal. But, you know, the way he sort of comports himself and the way he's just come into the club and was happy to speak a few words in front of everyone, you know, in that weird YouTube live thing that they did on, on Saturday... I don't think the fee is going to really bother him, but I do think I do I do know what you're saying about that, but I also think that it will be easy to see his impact if he makes the kind of impact that we hope he can, you know. Well, wh- where I was going with it was to say that given the type of player he is and given the position he plays, I honestly think the success of the signing will probably be weighed in trophies. Mm. Um I think People will look at this five-year contract and say, "Well, what do Ars- what do Arsenal achieve within that five years?" And that will be how we'd sort of figure out if the ends justify the means. Um, and I, I, I think that's going to be fascinating because it is such a big signing. And also, I think we have to be honest and say that the big signings in Arsenal's history have not always been the best signings in Arsenal's history. Mm. Um, we've paid a lot of money over the years uh, for players like Alexandre Lacazette or Nicola Pepe. Um, I think even the sort of long-term success of club record signings like Jose Reyes or Andrea Chavin are open to serious debate. Mm-hmm. Um you know, De- Dennis Burkamp obviously came in and was a, a, a massive success. And I think Meza Ozil, certainly for the first part of his time at Arsenal was, but then that, you know, faded pretty dramatically. But yeah, I think big expenditure does not guarantee a return um, necessarily or a return that's kind of in line with the spending. So that that's going to be really interesting to see. I, I think there are lots of reasons that Declan Rice does feel like more of a sure thing for reasons that we've talked about. But um, at that level of money, you never quite know. No, no, uh, it is it is a huge expenditure. And the only thing I suppose that gives me, not the only thing, but the thing that gives me uh, relative comfort with it is the fact that, that uh, this signing is part of a very clear strategy. Um, mm-hmm. It's been well thought out, and I think when it comes to incoming business, we've had far more hits than misses in the last few years. Um, and look, if you could cherry pick a player for Arsenal's midfield from any club in the Premier League, if a year ago you could say, take this player, uh, you can have him, who would you take? I think a lot of people would have picked Declan Rice. So it's not like... Uh, I don't think it's really a, a, a risk in, in that sense because people are aware of what a what a good player he is and, and what he can do and what he can bring to, to the team. Just a, a final bit on him before we talk about Jurian Timber because I think we need to because he's a, another big arrival. Clearly he is uh, an exceptional defensive-minded midfield player, Declan Rice. Yes. And I think he has been playing in a team where the defensive aspects of his game have been perhaps more necessary than they might be with Arsenal, which is to say that I think Arsenal as a team uh, will play consistently higher up the pitch than West Ham. Mm Mm-hmm which does sort of change his role a little bit. It doesn't mean that those defensive qualities won't be needed, but they might be needed in in other areas of the pitch. And when Manchester City's interest came in, there was uh, you know a lot of talk about how they see him as a potential replacement for uh, Ilkay Gundogan, who obviously played further forward and whose contributions weren't really defensive. 
they were um, there were goals and assists. So do you think that is an aspect of Declan Rice that Mikel Arteta will be looking to is it improve? Is that the right word? But he, do you think he's going to look to get more out of him uh, from an attacking perspective and not just sort of have him there as this guy who's anchoring the midfield and um, letting everybody else do that stuff? Mm, I, I actually don't think that. <laughs> I, I agree with you that he absolutely has that capability and that potential. And I could have seen him going to City and being a true box-to-box player um, and probably scoring, you know, eight goals a season or something like that. I mean, he scored plenty of goals for West Ham last year. Um, playing next to Tom Suchek, who did tend to sort of sit a bit more and doesn't really have the athletic capability of getting box-to-box like Rice does. But I think it's interesting. On In that Declan Rice unveiling video, we see that moment where Arteta, Edu and Rice are on the pitch together. And yeah. um, Edu goes, oh, this could be a midfield. And Arteta's like, yeah, yeah, left, right. I Meaning left, Ed- Edu, right, me, and then Declan in the middle. And they, and they sort of say, you can do all the defending. Like, as a little <laughs> joke. And I'm not saying that's quite how it will be in the Arsenal first team, but I do think that I, my gut feeling is that they will have looked at his attributes and said, look, you're a fantastic footballer. You can do a lot of things, but you can probably be the best in this position at the base. And as much as Arsenal are a team who control possession, when you look at the way we play and the way we may be playing next season, you know, we've talked about having a front five previously, but if you make one of those midfielders, Kai Havertz, it's probably more a front five than mm. ever before. Saka, uh, Odegaard, Jesus, Havertz, Martinelli. It's effectively, you know, five forwards on the pitch. I think Declan Rice will be absolutely critical at providing the balance and meaning that when Arsenal lose the ball and transitions happen, he can snuff them out, close the spaces down and just help Arsenal retain control in those situations. So, Mm. but I take your point. Like it it could go either way. My gut feeling is that they'll say to him, look, this is what we need from you um, to just help us establish and keep that control. But that's not to say that we won't ever see him driving forward and getting in the box because you know, that's part of his game. And that ability to carry the ball through the midfield is something that I think is really going to get fans off their feet uh, next season. Yeah, yeah. I'm really looking forward to seeing him play and see him turn out. And I like the addition of another big guy as yeah. well, I have to say. Like, we lost some physical presence with, with Granit Xhaka. Um, Kai Havertz coming in, if he plays in that position, adds a couple of inches. He's a bit taller than Granit Xhaka, and you know he is, uh, I think, the uh, joint tallest player at the club with William Saliba, six foot four. We've added six foot. Is he six six one? Maybe a little bit more. Declan Rice. This is a big team. It is a big mm-hmm. team, you know, and I think that's part of our, our Arteta's strategy is is to combine technicality with physicality. Definitely, and all I would say is, look how big City and Liverpool have got. Um, that is what's required, I mm. think, almost now. Um, and yeah, it, it, listen, we've we've all got these questions about how exactly it's going to work on the pitch, and uh, I just can't wait to find out. And nor it seems uh, can he. Yes, um, maybe we'll get a, a first glimpse of him this week. Um, mm-hmm. The game against MLS All Stars, I think, is is it like Wednesday night, middle of the night? here yeah early thursday morning exactly um so yeah it's uh, i think it's about 1 30 a.m in the uk on on the thursday okay uh, but he, he'll only really have been with the team for a few days so yeah maybe the... who, who knows what his involvement may be but you know i gather he turned up in great shape and he'd been on a training camp hadn't he um was that, was that, what was that i mean he did i i saw pictures of him with Who's the guy at um, AC Milan? Rafael Leao? Is Leao, that? Yeah. yeah. And Bruno Fernandes? Yeah, it's increasingly common, isn't it, that, that players will 
you know, use their some at the end of their holidays to do these kind of uh, boot camps to get themselves back in shape for preseason. Um, Not like fish and chips and pints in the past. Yeah, it's, it's come a long way, hasn't yeah. it? <laughs> just a bit, just a bit. Um, let's talk a little bit about Jurian Timber. I know that this is a player that you're very excited about. I I, I really like the the profile of this player. Um. He talked about his versatility being a good thing. He can play center half. He can play right back. He talked about playing in midfield as well, that that's something that he can do and he's comfortable doing. Whether or not we ever see that, we'll have to wait and see. But a really, really astute signing from from Ajax to sort of bolster the right-hand side of our defense and I think it says a lot, doesn't it? You, you, you always see these welcome videos. You very rarely see a football player get a goodbye video from the club that they're leaving, which tells you the esteem in which he was held at Ajax. Yeah, very, very well thought of, and you know, came through the ranks there um, to become an integral first team player, playing from a really young age as well. That's that's such a thread, isn't it? Through these Arteta signings, yeah, guys who've accumulated vast amount of experience uh, at a young age uh, and it's certainly true with the three guys we brought in this summer um i i'm really excited about this player i think he adds depth quality champions league experience which is something we don't mm. have a ton of among some of our players um i think a bit like Jakub Kivio on the left-hand side, he can fill a number of roles. He can play as a centre-half, he can play as a right-back. Both Kivio and Timber in their careers have played in midfield a bit too. Um, so yeah, he, he can be he can be the solution to a lot of problems. And you know, for us to be spending that much money on a player who... We do need him, but it's not like he immediately steps into a great gaping void in the first team. Again, it shows you how far we've come and how the level of the club has risen, that to bring in someone to compete with our first team at this point in time, it's going to cost you the best part of 50 million. Um, and I'm, 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 I think people will really, really enjoy watching him. I just think he's so stylish in everything he does. He's kind of a classic Ajax defender really mm. uh, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun so before we go into the break I did look at the squad list for the US tour yeah it is a very senior squad when you look at it the only in inverted commas academy player is um Armario Kozier Dubry that's right and that I presume that's partly because Reese Nelson's not made the trip. Yeah, exactly. So he's sort of like a backup for um, for Bakayo Saka in a way. And I I see, you know, there's a couple of goalkeepers there. Alex Runerson is included. Um, Carl Hine included. But it's 29 players minus Smith Rowe, minus Thomas Partey, minus Reese Nelson, as you've mentioned, uh, minus Cedric, Minus Lokonga, minus Pepe. Uh, maybe there's one more as well that I'm missing, but it's a big squad and yeah. it's it's probably a bit too big. So while we've all been waiting and anticipating these arrivals in Timber and Rice, the focus now, I think, for, for Edu has to be on trimming the fat a little bit, right? For sure. That is the next step for Arsenal. And what, what a luxury, you have to say, to be able to focus on that, having landed three of your top targets. Um, but at some stage, those books need to be rebalanced a bit. Uh, and I think certainly if there are to be any further arrivals, which I don't think is a, a, a given at all, but if that were to happen, I think there's got to be money brought into the club. Granite Shaka has gone um, for, in the end, uh, a reasonable fee. But, yeah, there's a number more who you think the club will be looking to offload. And I think pretty crucial is that they try and generate Premier League interest in some of these players because outside of that, you know, there just isn't the money. I mean, we saw the club reject an offer for Rob Holding this week, 2.5 million euros. 
uh, from, mm. uh, was it Besiktas? Yeah. A, a Turkish team. And I think that just shows you the lay of the land. You've got to try, if you can, and sell these players within England. And, you know, we always think about Eddie's job and it's sort of a job of, you know, he's got to be on top of recruitment, speaking to agents. Another part of his job is knowing what is the landscape for other Premier League clubs? Who needs mm. uh, a left back? Who needs a uh, centre forward? Who needs, you know, a holding midfield player? And what have we got that we can use to kind of fill that need and profit from? Mm. Um, that is part of the job too. And I noticed that Edu wasn't on board the, the plane, I don't think, uh, in the first flight that's gone out to America. Hopefully it's because he's working on getting some sales done because that is absolutely the, the next step, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, someone like Cedric, for example, not even included in, in the tour. Uh, I think that probably says plenty about, you know, his uh, involvement in the, in the team this season. Yes. I, I saw this question from Matt Lando who said during the Declan Rice announcement live stream, I couldn't help but notice Cedric was left without a seat and was sat on the floor. <laughs> Is this a metaphor for his position within the squad? <laughs> that was quite Perhaps. funny. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think I, look. I mean, the, the the fact is right that this is a tour, and we all take preseason the way we want to take preseason. But there is an element of right. The the hard work begins now. We've got to start getting ourselves ready for a new season where the expectations are going to be really, really high. So you want to work with the players who you're going to work with throughout the season. And if somebody's not going to be part of that, it's maybe a little bit ruthless to just leave them behind. But they don't really, if they don't have a future at the football club, if they're not going to be involved, you know, it's 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 the best thing to do, no? Yeah, I think so. I mean, on the same... On the other side of the coin, it's interesting to see who has been taken on tour, you know. Uh, it's interesting that Balogun, for example, is absolutely still with the first-team squad. Uh, Marquinhos, uh, Austin Trusty mm. is with the group. Um, so it's interesting that, you know, I think if you're among that touring party, the door can't be entirely closed to you. True. Um, and, it's it, yeah, it's also noteworthy that, you know, Miles Lewis Skelly and Ethan Ranieri caught the eye a little bit, didn't they, in Germany against Nuremberg with some impressive contributions. Uh, Rule Walters being another. Mm. None of those young players have joined Koja Dubry with the first team for this trip. And as I say, I think Koja Dubry is probably purely there because Reese Nelson isn't. Um, yeah. So Arteta, he does take these tours very seriously. You know, it was a it was significant last summer when he didn't take Charlie Patino with him. Um, and yet again, he's shown a kind of a sternness, a seriousness about this preseason tour. And yeah. rightly so, because... I agree, yeah. I think it's maybe a little overlooked quite how important the preseason tour was for Arsenal last summer and what a good platform it provided for the start to our season. We found our team, our mm. first 11, during that preseason tour. Yeah, that's true. And we need more than the first 11 uh, this time around, as as we've True. said many times, and you know, it does look as if even with some departures, that this is a much more uh, rounded and deep squad uh, that hopefully will be able to compete over uh, all the competitions we're playing in. Um, right? Should we take a break? I think we should. We should. We should. We'll take a little break. We'll come back and do your questions and more in part two right after this. Let's do this. <laughs> Welcome back to the Arsecast Extra. This is part two of the show where we answer questions that you send to us on Twitter at Gunnarblog and at Arsblog. Also on the Arsblog Discord chat server, which you get access to if you are an Arsblog member on Patreon. Will I go first? Will you go first? Who will go first? Uh, well, Jack Perry said, like the This Is Anfield sign, is it time to get a Les Dudis sign in the Emirates Tunnel? 100%. I can answer that quickly. Yeah. Yes. Did you... Um, did you um, spend much time getting your Les Do This hat made up? 
mm, about 90 seconds. The internet's quite an extraordinary place. You can, you know, very quickly write some words on a hat and get it sent to you. <laughs> and it, it arrived the day that Declan Rice signed. It can't be coincidence. The summer of Les Dudis is happening. It's happening right before our very eyes. Um, before we get into questions, I thought this was quite an interesting one. I know we've talked a lot about Declan Rice, but Lowy133 on the Discord said, if only we had somebody at the club who has experience of being the captain of a David Moyes team that can play six or eight and has moved to Arsenal. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's the boss. How much do you think Mikel Arteta sees of himself in Declan Rice? And is this the transfer he wishes he had had at his age? Wow, that's a really interesting mm. question. I mean, you know, I've often sort of thought as um, Martin of, of Martin Odegaard as kind of mini Mikel within the squad, but mm. you have to think with Declan Rice arriving, he's got another mini Mikel there potentially. Um, I actually saw a clip from preseason training the other day of Mikel doing keepy ups with. Uh, uh, Odegaard. Odegaard, and I think maybe the new attacking phase coach, right. um, whose name escapes me temporarily. Sorry about that. But uh, Mikel's absolutely still got it. You forget how technically accomplished uh, mm. he he was as a player. Um, yeah, I think he probably does see something of himself in Rice. And... I think he places his huge emphasis on knowledge of this league. I think it's so interesting that a foreign coach places such emphasis on British talent with Premier League experience. I mean, when you think about it, he has spent more time in Britain than he has Absolutely. in Spain. You know, uh, yeah. clearly uh, his roots are what they are. But, you know, from the time he moved to Rangers and then to Everton and Arsenal and then... Manchester City. So like the vast majority of his career has been in England. And I think as a, obviously a very smart, intelligent man, he has his own clear ideas of what works and what does not work in the Premier League, both from a playing and, and managerial perspective. Definitely. I mean, it's almost, it's always an interesting little quirk that, you know, he's a Spanish coach and he hasn't got a single Spanish player in the squad. Um, I think that shows you how much of a kind of, Anglophile he is, and how much he, how much emphasis he places upon you know the Premier League being its own distinct mm. thing. Um, but yeah, I think he's obviously going to be a mentor figure for Declan Rice, and who knows, maybe he will be putting Rice through a similar kind of transition to the one Arteta himself made when he was uh, a player at Arsenal because he arrived. Uh, at Arsenal as someone who'd had a lot more attacking mm. freedom at Everton yeah, yeah. Um, and then became the guy at the base. And yeah, my, my instinct is that Rice may follow a, a similar path yeah. to the Emirates. I remember writing a blog many years ago about wanting to sign Mikel Arteta yeah. or um, to play with Sesk. I remember mm. writing that at the, at the time. I don't know whether he would have been the same age as, as Declan Rice, maybe a little bit older, but he always struck me as a player who would have fit in very well at Arsenal, um, you know, and, and obviously did in crazy circumstances. Twice, I guess, he's he's come to the club in, in crazy circumstances. So uh, it would have been interesting to see him, uh, a younger version of Mikel Arteta at Arsenal, but it wasn't to be. Yeah, but and, and that's probably one of the big regrets of Arteta's playing career. As much as he loved his time at Rangers and PSG and Everton, you know, he, he pro if he could have one thing, he probably wishes that he'd come to a, a big, big Premier League club earlier. Mm. Um, and who knows? You know, that might be something he said to Rice. Don't miss this chance because I didn't have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. Okay, let me ask you this one. You did mention him, um, but we have a couple of questions, uh, as we seem to do every week now about this player. But Luca Skywalker on the Discord says, Morning, gents. As we know... Preseason is the real season. So what are you each paying attention to as the games go on? I will be watching the role Balagoon plays. I still think he has a chance to take Eddie's place in the squad. And Count Swagula on the Discord as well says, do you think our owners being American might affect the thinking around Balagoon's long-term future, given that he is t to become a top star for the US national team and very marketable? I thought that was a really interesting question, actually, the Count Swagula 
what mm. about um Balogun's Americanness and us being an American owned club and mm. would that have any say in our strategy around him? You know, I think Matt Turner, for example, his Americanness was not a reason he was signed. I think it was genuinely he was scouted by the goalkeeping department and they really liked him. Um but someone like Austin Trusty, I think it is relevant that he is American and we are American owned. That's not to say he's not a good player, but I think it was part of why he arrived at the club. Um, mm. KSC sort of looking to kind of join the dots between their different uh, sporting enterprises. And well, it, it, so it's tempting to think it could have some sway until you remember that this is Mikel Arteta we're talking about and ultimately <laughs> it's his first team squad and he will probably insist on absolute authority about those footballing decisions. So I don't think he'll be f for turning if he decides, you know, he wants Eddie and Balogun's got to go. Mm. But listen, it's interesting. Balogun is on the tour. Um, I saw Fabrizio Romano saying he's on the list for Inter Milan potentially now who look like negotiations with Romelu Lukaku have broken down. Um, that would be interesting. But he's got his chance to impress Arteta. And yeah. to be fair to him, he's spent the last 12 months taking chances and impressing people. So I don't think we can rule it out. No, I don't think so either. It is an opportunity for player and manager, I guess. I mean, this is a different version of Foller and Balagoon, right? Mm -hmm. This is a, a, a more mature guy, a guy who's been out on loan, a guy who's appears to be anyway quite single-minded or, or certainly has clarity about what he wants to do with his career. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that Mikel Arteta is a very demanding coach and manager and, and will drive his player. So if he gets that kind of response from Balagoon, who knows? Um, interest from Inter Milan is nice, I guess, but what can they pay? How much can they pay for Balagoon? You talked about selling players and... and needing to sell players in England. Ideally. You know? Um, and there's the, the the two edges or the two sides of that coin that if Balagoon does depart, I think there'd be a lot more... I mean, I don't think people will like it per se, but I think people would prefer if we got uh, money from a foreign club and he went there rather than get a little bit more money and for him to stay in England, you know? So, yeah, and, 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 you know, one of the things I like about... Italy as a destination is they're very open to that sort of buyback, sell on. Mm. You, know, you get a lot of that in Syria, and I think that could be valuable in, yeah. in a deal for Balogun. Is but, there any, is there anything else in terms of preseason that you're you're looking out for? I mean, obviously we're keen to see that midfield triumvirate of of Rice, Havertz, and Odegaard to see how that operates. But are there other things maybe on the the back burner that you're going to keep an eye on or is it just a case of like oh, well we'll see what happens and uh, see what we can see from from what Mikel Arteta does no there's lots of, I'm curious about I mean I think the left eight position generally uh, Leo Trossard started there uh, in mm. Germany uh, albeit you know there weren't a great deal of alternatives available to Arteta at that time so curious to see what happens there we know Havertz is principally the plan there but will he be better than from the start will he go for someone who's you know, more bedded into the squad. We shall see. Uh, I'm curious to see if we see more of Kiwi or left back. Yeah. I just think it's an interesting development, something we saw towards the end of last season. And, you know, with Kieran Tierney's future in still continuing doubt, potentially, I'm intrigued to see if we see a bit more of that. Um, mm. Balogun, obviously, is a, a big one, as you mentioned. Um, and I, yeah, it's a shame about Reese Nelson being injured just because having given him the new contract, I was kind of curious to see exactly how he was deployed and yeah. what exactly we've got on our hands there. Um, mm. But I presume it's a fitness issue that's keeping him from Yeah, I think involved. so. I think so. I'm, I'm also curious to see what happens with Smith Rowe when he comes oh, yeah. back. Yeah. You know, obviously he's he's been away with England under 21s they've won the the championship and that's brilliant for them but when he comes back you know what what sort of Smith Row do we see um where is he going to play 
all those kinds of things uh, I- I'm really curious about because I'd love to see him make his way back into contention. And I think, you know, we talked about a big squad. I think he is, he's part of that. He should be part of that. His talent, his ability is, is not in question. So, you know, how quickly he can hit the ground running this season will be, will be very interesting to see. No, I think that's a good point. And uh, Tommy Asu as well, part of the tour squad. Yeah. So, yeah, would love to see like, you know, how he's faring, how he's getting on. He's our Swiss army knife basically yeah. uh, as a yeah. defender so um yeah well w- one guy who's not on the list for the tour is uh thomas parte and th- that sort of sparked more speculation that he could be leaving the club mm. and art teacher on the discord said morning gents how are you feeling about a potential parte exit personally i'm very worried we need a deeper squad than last year and he will be integral to us as part of that squad especially because of our champions league commitment I mean, the best version of Thomas Partey as a player is an exceptional player, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I do think there's something so interesting about what we've done this summer in the transfer market because for what, 80%, 85% of last season, Partey and Xhaka were really, really good, like yeah. exceptional. Maybe the one of the best midfield pairings in... I don't know. I know it's not necessarily a duo because they were playing a little bit distinct, not like two deep lying midfielders, but you know, they were both very, very good. And what we've done is spend 170 million pounds on two players who ostensibly are going to replace them. If it's Rice in the deep lying midfield role and Havertz in the, the left eight, you know, we've basically taken a part of our team, which was exceptional last season and, decided to upgrade or, or renew in, in there. We've had the conversation before about if the money is on offer for a, a 30 year old player, what do you do? Same with Shaka. Um, is it your last chance to get some money back on a player? I don't think you can sell Thomas Partey without bringing in somebody else though. I know we have Jorginho there. I know we have uh, Mohamed El Neni who's back but it would just feel a little bit light to me. So if he does go, and I don't know if he is or not, I don't know how much truth there is in the the stories about Saudi Arabian clubs being interested in him or his desire to go there as well. Mm-hmm. You know, they may be interested. He may not want to go there. So, yeah, it'll be... It'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, I suspect maybe the club would be open to letting him go if the money was right, but then that money would need to be reinvested in another midfield player. Yeah, I mean, the club have been specific and said they expect him to join up with the group in America next week, I think, or or shortly. Mm. Uh, Smith, Rowe and Partey were the two they picked out and said, you know, we, we think they will be joining up, which makes you think, Presumably there's a fitness issue there. I actually don't know the reason that he has not made the initial party, but given his history, it wouldn't surprise you if there was a, a little muscular strain or something which made them think, well, let's keep him back. Um, I completely accept that from a footballing perspective, he uh, uh, he would be a loss. I mean, he's a very, very, very good midfield player. Um, but maybe the club feel it's the right time to cash in if that opportunity presents itself. And I agree with you that if he were to go, we probably would see somebody signed. Um, In fact, almost certainly Mm. see somebody signed. So hopefully that would kind of, you know, offset some of those concerns. It's tricky because you're right. The Thomas party we had for 80% of the season was fantastic, but the Thomas party we had for the rest wasn't great. And Mm. I guess, part of Mikel Arteta's decision will be, well, which one do I think I'm getting next season? Yeah. I mean, he's he's had injury issues ever since he arrived as well. So maybe that's playing a part in, in whatever decision the club might make. Um, but yeah, it is one of those situations where, you know, when a, a high profile player isn't on the tour, it does raise questions. So um, we'll wait and yeah, see. inevitably. Um, what was I going to ask you? I had a good one here. Bum, bum, 
Boom. From Master Johnbury on the Discord. He said, after signing Timber, I was thinking about how the profile of centre-backs have changed so much. Now they need to be elite athletes and ball progressors. But some of the qualities that were so valued in the last generation, position, bravery, height, power, feel less important. Do you think we'll ever go back to a place where the Mertesacker, Terry, Vidic-style centre-backs are considered the best in the world? I think often the guys who are the very best in the world sort of combine both of those skill sets. I mean, you know, you could look at Gabriel and Saliba and see them through the prism of being traditional center halves. They're both six foot plus, they're mm. broadly built, they're very, very powerful, but they also have this technical aspect to their game, which elevates them beyond being just that. Um, I think there are defenders, central defenders who are more slightly built, you know, Timber would be one, Lissandro Martinez, an, an obvious example of another, mm. but who's, who are so good, uh, technically that they're able to kind of compensate, or at least they offer so much more, um, because of their ability on the ball that that doesn't become an issue. Um, but I think there will always be a need and a demand for, big powerful athletes at the back and when mm. you look at the best teams look at Virgil van Dijk look at Ruben Diaz I think that archetype is still very present in yeah. modern football yeah I mean the 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 other side of it is why are defenders like that so sought after it's because of what you have to deal with as a defender these days when it comes to the kind of attackers you're facing right yeah you know what I mean you, you've got guys I mean someone like I know Erling Haaland is a bit of a freak, right? Um, but you've got attackers who are good in the air, who are quick, who are strong. You know, you you face so many different challenges from the opposition that you have to be multifaceted. And I think the best defenders are going to be the ones who can deal with the most uh, challenges that the opposition throw at them. And somebody like Saliba, I think, is the perfect example of that. Physically strong, tall, fast, great on the ball, good in the air, good tackler. You know, you have to have all those skills. I don't think you can be just, like, brave and position yourself well if you can't combine that with all the other attributes that you need as a center half. So I don't think there's any going back, if that makes sense. I just think it's part of the, uh, the way football evolves and the way um, players in certain positions have to evolve to, to cope with the demands of football. Yeah. And I think sometimes you get these outlier individuals who really change how, uh, how the game is played and, and mm. what the demands are. And I think Haaland may be in that category, you know, there was a period of time, a good few years ago, where fashion for centre forwards was quite different. This was kind of Spain's false nine era, you know, and mm. I think you were seeing a lot more five foot ten centre halves in top teams, um, coping relatively reasonably. But I think ha Haaland, you know, is is an example, is maybe the most obvious example of how that is shifting again mm. to like a much more athletic profile and I think that that needs to be matched up in defence um, for the most part yeah so before you oh, ask this... sorry before you oh, ask a uh, bit of transfer news oh, Arsenal are allowing goalkeeper Arthur Okonkwo to leave this summer that'll be an interesting one won't it because you know he's uh, did very well on loan at Sturm Graz yeah. last season young English goalkeeper one of those when you're looking at, <clears throat> I don't want to reopen the old cockermouth can of worms again, but it's one of those where you're looking to see what we can maybe bring in for a young player who's leaving a club where the perception of the talent at that club is as high as it has been for a long time. Yeah, and he had a good loan with Sturm Graz yeah. last season. If only he were from cockermouth. Imagine what we could demand for him. If only. He's from Dicklington, though, apparently. <laughs> um, yeah, interesting that that will be permanent. I mean, the problem he's got, and the problem Arsenal have got to a certain extent, is that him and Carl Hine are very close in terms of age. 
Um, I think there's a decent chance neither of them are with the first team group next season. I think Carl Hines probably like to go out on loan. Who's the third it's, keeper then? Is this the is this the um, Mark it's, Poom uh, moment? Ben Foster. <laughs> yeah. uh, Mark Poom yeah. is coming back. Uh, Guillaume Wormuz. I I don't know, but it, you know, if a conquer goes out uh, permanently. Hein would like to go out on loan and play. I think he probably needs to go out. He does, and play. yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, didn't have, you know, the most auspicious game against Nuremberg. Um, I have to say. So yeah, I think there is potentially room there for a late addition in the window. Uh, we shall see. Want to keep an eye on maybe. Mm. Uh, but he's a good. He's a good player, Conquo, and well thought of. So I'd like to think if he were to leave. You know, some some very inexperienced keepers have moved for some pretty pricey sums yeah. recently. Yeah. Um, um, so let's have this question. We spoke a bit about price tags and pressure, but the real chicken dipper said, "Goodly morning, fellas." Thinking about fan pressure of expectation in correlation to their fees, who do you think has it hardest between Havertz, Rice, and Timber? Havertz. Same. Mostly because he's, you know, he's come from Chelsea and he was sort of underwhelming there. Timber has been brilliant for Ajax and we've brought him in. So you're bringing in a guy who's had a convincing couple of seasons. Declan Rice, obviously, for West Ham and for England has been pivotal and performs at a high level on a consistent basis. Whereas Havertz has been up and down, it's fair to say, at Chelsea. And I think we, we've talked about the potential mitigating circumstances you know, Chelsea being a basket case, him maybe being played in a position which doesn't necessarily suit him, but that is what he's bringing. And um, we had a similar one actually on the the Discord, uh, T-Dog, who said Havertz was likely signed to fill a role where an important player departed, plus he cost 60 million and he's from Chelsea. Is this a cocktail for very high expectations? He needs to hit the ground running, doesn't he? Um, I think that that nails it, really. The, yeah. the biggest problem Havertz has got is who he's replacing and how good Granite Xhaka was last and season. And where he's come from. Let's not yes. ignore that. Yes, I mean, that's always puts you on the back foot. But I think, you know, the way Arsenal fans have received Jorginho shows that if you mm. perform to a certain level, of course, they're, they're willing to accept you. Um, I think it's the fact that Xhaka was so integral and he's not there. You know, so there's no sort of like mm. steady, um, slowly introducing Havertz. We need to fill that role immediately. That brings pressure. Yes, I agree. I agree. All right. Um, let me ask you this one from Mr. Smith Robot on Discord. How much Im- importance do you place on the community shield this year? Would winning it be A, completely irrelevant, B, a way of setting the tone for the season, or C, set expectations too high for the season? Well, I've bought my ticket. Um, so I'm hoping that it'll be entertaining and competitive. I think that, do you know what? I think it's a sort of, um, it's not quite a free hit, but I sort of think it's lovely because if you lose, you get to say, well, it's just friendly. And if you win, as a manager, you can use that to say, look, you've gone out and beaten the champions. Let's make that a benchmark. Mm. Um, I suppose if you're beaten heavily, that would be pretty dispiriting. Uh, but you have always got the get out of, listen, that's a warm up. The real season starts next week. Yeah, I, 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 think it, I think it will have weight this year. I remember the years when we were going for the title every year, seemingly against Man United. And those Community Shield games, they could get feisty. I remember Francis Jeff was getting sent off. That's anyway. right, yeah. Who um, did he kick? Was it- yeah. And I think maybe that was the start of the Invincible season. Not 100% sure on that. I think Jeff has left shortly afterwards to Charlton. Mm. We ended up winning the league the following year. Someone may correct me. But I, I seem to remember that those games did feel like they mattered. He kicked Phil they- Neville. I mean, Neville. who could blame him? Probably his finest moment mm-hmm. in an Arsenal shirt. It is, yeah. Didn't, um, didn't kick him hard enough. <laughs> I think, 
Yeah, I, I think that it will. You know, if it's if it's Man City against Wigan, say, because they won the FA Cup last year, it's kind of like, well, you know, it's just a curtain raiser. But when it's the two teams that finished first and second, how can it not? offer some sort of benchmark mm. for what's to come. Yeah, I think I, that's fair. I think there'll be a lot of eyes on it. And I think I think it will matter. And I think Mikel Arteta will play it like it matters. Oh, for sure. For sure. We were in the Community Shield before as well, weren't we? We won. We beat Liverpool. Yeah. Uh, but, I, you know, I remember that Arsenal sometimes would make five changes at half time, or I don't think Mikel will approach it quite like that. I think he'll, he'll play it to win it. Yeah, I think so. And you're right. You know, if we win it, it's great. We've not quite got the monkey off our back in terms of Manchester City and beating them, but it it would go some way to convincing these players that they can do it, right? And if you lose, it doesn't matter because it's just a fucking friendly and nobody cares. Um, <laughs> That's certainly how we'll be framing. Yeah, exactly. That's how I'll uh, do it anyway. Um Slightly different question here. Henry Powell on the Discord said, a huge week for Arsenal, but I'd like to touch on a slightly different topic. We saw Deli Ali's interview with Gary Neville last week. Firstly, what were your thoughts? Secondly, do you think enough is done by the clubs and governing bodies to protect the mental well-being of players? Well, I I didn't watch it, I have to say. Um, I you know, read about it, obviously read the, the headlines and the story and, and everything else, but I, you know, I couldn't really couldn't watch it um based on what i'd read i just didn't want to you know that's um, absolutely fair enough i think it it sounds horrendous um is enough done i mean i suppose what it tells you right is that underneath every football jersey is an actual person a human being and there is a pantomime ele- element to football fandom and villainy and all that kind of stuff and down the years because of who we played for because of you know, the way he carried himself at times, he was very much a pantomime villain, wasn't he? Or, a, you know, a figure of uh, hatred, I guess. But yeah, you, you are reminded that you just don't know what's going on with people or what they've been through or, you know, why or how things in their life might inform the way that they behave on the pitch, you know? Um, Absolutely, yeah. So... Yeah, it was obviously what he's been through is, is horrendous and, and all you can do is wish him all the best for the future. And I think he, I mean, the, the other sort of aspect of this is the fact that he did the interview because he was going to be outed by the tabloids. Yeah. Which is, you know, so grim and tabloid culture, British tabloid culture in particular is just so noxious and yet so part of the media life, if that makes sense, that it is a horrendous invasion of, of him and other people and the way that these um, publications behave. And yet it's sort of just, I won't say accepted, but people view it as part and parcel of, of the way these publications operate. Um, and they're criticized for it, but they still do it and they continue to do it. And it's horrendous. It's horrible. Um, so he had to get out in front of it. And he, he obviously did. As for clubs and governing bodies doing more for players and doing more for their mental health. I guess there is still an element of stigma to it, isn't there in the, in the dressing room or in, in the game itself. But the more people like Deli Ali and others speak up about the, the struggles that they've had, I remember Per Mertesacker talking about it uh, very openly. The more people talk about it, the more other players will be willing to open up. They don't have to necessarily do it publicly, but maybe they can feel like they're in an environment where within the club itself, if they talk about this or if they open up to the manager or the coaches, they're not seen as weak, but they're seen as somebody who needs help um, to perform at the best level for their football clubs. So uh, I, I think there is more awareness now, and that's a good thing, but I also think there is clearly a way to go as well yeah definitely i think awful that he was pushed to do it by the tabloids credit to him for sort of doing it in a way where at least he gets to have probably a bit more control and relatively independently um i there's it's interesting you know i think footballers they make so much money that sometimes we 
are guilty of uh, kind of slightly dehumanizing mm-hmm. them. And, yeah. you know, no salary really can uh, assuage some of the traumas that someone like Deli Ali has suffered in his life. And in terms of the question of sort of duty of care, I, I think there are some sort of interesting points maybe to be raised. I mean, something that, that he's really suffered with has been sleeping pill addiction. And I don't think he's an anomaly within football in that respect. Mm. I think there's been a bit of a problem there. Um, I'm sure clubs are attentive to this stuff, but maybe there are ways, you know, they could provide uh, more education or, or more testing or things like that to help players. I don't know. Hopefully some good can come out of this and, and some of those steps can be taken yeah. because it's a shame to see, listen, I'm no fan of Deli Ali, and I think it has to be possible for us to kind of retain the pantomime um, partiality of being a football fan and at the same time recognise that these are real people with real problems. I think we basically, as fans, have to be mature enough to be able to kind of hold and balance those two things. Yeah. Um, So, you know, as an Arsenal fan, I was not sad to see the demise of of Deli Ali, the kind of pantomime figure, but as a human being, I I accept and I'm saddened that uh, an undoubted talent has, you know, not been fulfilled. Suffered, basically. Yeah, Yeah. and suffered, and suffered. And Um, we don't like suffering. I did did mention this on another Arscast. I can't remember if it was last week on here or or the main, uh, the Friday one. But there was a great podcast on Training Ground Guru. I don't know if you had a chance to listen to it. With oh, a, no, I haven't. With a yet. guy called Des Fahey, uh, who was like basically the head of, uh, I'm just going to get his uh, full title up here, but basically he was in charge of strength and development or, or for the academy. Let me see. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, Des Fahey, Training Ground Guru podcast i get this up here um yeah he was head of sports medicine and athletic development at the arsenal academy from 2013 to 2021 Mm -hmm. and it's a really interesting podcast about physically developing players and the way it's graded it's actually really fascinating from that perspective but he talked a bit about per mertesacker and the ethos or the the mantra, I think, uh, at the academy is strong young gunners. Mm. And he doesn't mean just guys who can bench press a lot. The approach, I think, at academy level with Per Mertesacker is much more rounded. It's much more focused on the person than maybe some other football clubs. And obviously, they want to develop these young talents and bring them through to the first team and and develop good players for Arsenal. And if they don't play for Arsenal, then they can go and have a good career somewhere else. But I think there's also an approach whereby they are able to cope with the things that life throws at you in a, in a better way also. So strong about dealing with difficult situations and all that kind of stuff. So that kind of approach appears to be more baked in at Arsenal. Um, which is really interesting to think about, you know, um, because a lot of these young players won't make it. No, they just won't make it. But if they're better prepared for the outside world, then I think as a football club, we have done our job for those young guys. And I think it's really important for Per Mertesacker that that is, you know, part of the approach and how you, how you influence the lives of young guys at a very, crucial period right Mm -hmm. where they're um you're just sort of turning into a real person if that makes sense you know um if you think back to your own time as a teenager you know you could think of decisions that you made where maybe you could have gone down a different path maybe ended up in a different place than where you are right now you know um so being self-aware and being conscious of the decisions that you make and how they can affect your life is is just so important definitely and and i think as well it's good for us to be conscious of the many factors that influence whether or not a player 
makes it or fulfills their potential. You know, mm. we often think of it as simple as like talent in, output out, but there are so many other complicating factors um, that can either set them up for success or for failure. Um, and that can mean the right network, the right people around you, the right kind of support. And not all players have that. And, you know, a lot of the time we we might talk about a young player when he's a prospect at 16, 17, and then five years later go, oh, yeah, he didn't really make it. He squandered it. We might put it on him when actually it's a lot more to do with the environment mm -hmm. they're in. Um, and they have very little control of that at that tender yeah. age. So, yeah, it was interesting. I think it's worth a watch. It's definitely worth a watch. All right. Uh, let me ask you this one very quickly, because I know we have to wrap up shortly. Thierry Ennui, who's at Zach SHT, Zach shit. Um, he said, should Odegaard's leadership feel threatened by the arrival of, of Declan Rice? I don't think so. And I don't get the impression that Odegaard is the type of guy to feel threatened about that. Um, you know, how many times last season did we see that camera sort of peering into the Arsenal huddle and it was Granit Xhaka doing the talking or Zinchenko doing the talking or mm. even Gabriel Jesus. Um, I think there is a more kind of uh, shared attitude towards leadership within the group. And I think Declan Rice will probably become part of that pretty quickly. Mm. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, again... You know, all the discussion we had in the in the first half of the show about Declan Rice, we didn't talk too much about his leadership qualities no. and, you know, how much that might have played a part in our desire to bring him in. Uh, but I think it is absolutely uh, a big factor. If you're losing someone like Xhaka, then you do need to um, to sort of find a way to replace that amount of dressing room personality and uh, players will step up and other people will develop in, in that sense. But he is obviously sees himself anyway you you get this uh the sense that he sees himself as a leader as a captain he's been captain of west ham big personality confident guy he's coming in i don't think he'll be uh don't think he's coming in to sort of take over or anything like that but i think artella likes players with that kind of personality because they will take responsibility on the pitch you know yeah. the two things go hand in hand and if you are you know if we can replicate what we did last season and then push it that little bit further, you are going to need players who can sort of drag you over the line in certain games or in certain scenarios, whether it's, you know, grabbing you a late goal to get a win or whether it's defending like mad to stop the opposition scoring in the last minute. So you keep three points, whatever it might be. Those players who come up clutch in those big moments are the likes of Declan Rice. Yeah, the best you know? teams are full of leaders. Um, exactly. And Arsenal are, are headed in that direction. You know, they've got a lot of people now within the squad who have worn the armband or are wearing the armband internationally. Mm. Um, I don't think that's coincidence. I don't think so. Um, and Just finally from, yeah. from uh, me, actually, um, Ryan asked, uh, were you guys a little bit disappointed when Arsenal asked us to tune into their live YouTube feed and it wasn't for the unveiling of Steve Pasta? <laughs> Steve Pasta's coming later in the window, I think. Right, we need, we need to sell, sell one or two and then we can launch the, the bid for then we can get, Steve Pasta. Yeah, what, what were you expecting from that you know, uh, YouTube video, by the way? <laughs> um, I didn't know, actually. Yeah. I had no idea. Um I th am I right that actually the announcement happened at 105? Because I few, saw a few people saying, is that a nod to 105 million? Uh, I think it possibly did on Twitter, but... I can't imagine that Arsenal would be like acknowledging how much money they'd pay in that way, but uh, you never know. Um, I mean, it went live on the website at exactly 1 p.m. Right. Um, did you see, did you get the, the video or the little clip doing the rounds of... 29 plus 12 equals 41. Oh, no, I didn't see that. Yeah. So 29 Kai Havertz plus 12. Jurian oh. Timber equals 41. There you go. And he's keeping the 41 from West Ham. Yeah. yeah. Thoughts on that? Do you care? I uh, don't care. Knew, I knew he would. He, he's worn it forever at West Ham. He really likes it. So. Yeah. Um, 
but don't care. Club are probably happy because they can extra number charge you for an extra shirt. number. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is how we're going to be able to afford Steve Pasta all the extra ones <laughs> rather than four he's 41. This he's doing a he's doing a great job already. Uh, I think to be fair to the club I think it's a fixed price um for name and number these days but uh Right. If anything it's probably costing us more to print that extra number. That is why, you know. This is why Steve Pastor's on the back burner for now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, fingers crossed we can get that deal uh, done. Um, right. Well, look, I think we'll leave it there for this week's show. Of course, the team are in the US. I'm going to be heading to the US on Thursday. Uh, there's a big uh, party, basically, in New York on the Friday night. Arsenal NYC are putting together a, a big event in Union Square. So if you want to find out more, if you're going to be in town, arsenal.nyc, you'll find the details on there. It is a ticketed event. And then we'll be out in Los Angeles the following week um, to watch the game against Barcelona. So hopefully see quite a few of you out there. Sounds rubbish, mate. Yeah, Glad I know. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, no, I'm pleased about it. Living it. It's raining here today. <laughs> it fucking hasn't stopped raining here for about three days. It's bullshit. This is the worst uh, of your life. That, that's going to be great fun. That's going to be awesome. So will you, will you, will you be doing the podcast, what, from – you'll be in the States next week. I'll be in the States next week, so we'll chat off air about when exactly we can we can get it recorded, but we'll do it from the States, yes. Um, cool. And we will uh, keep you up to date. Of course, the blog will keep going. The news will keep going. Um, and we'll do some updates um, over on Patreon as well. Um, do some bits and bobs uh, for Patreon. So, yeah, it should be good. And, of course, uh, Elliot from Arsenal Vision will be out there. Tim is going to be out there. Andrew Allen is going to be out there. So uh, I think we're doing a thing on the – is it the Tuesday before the Barcelona game in L.A.? There's an event. Um and we're doing a bit of a thing with maybe a couple of the Invincibles. So that could be quite good. That'd be awesome. That'd be quite good. But so I'm going to the dentist that day, just looking at my diary. So oh, it's kind of like, you know, who's really winning here? I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, well, I wish you all the best uh, at the dentist. <laughs> Surely not. Everyone always wants me to lose teeth, right? Good things happen. Maybe you just need more teeth. Have you thought about that? Just what, get, get like, more in, so I've got more, more to lose. Well, That's just a good idea. Just get more in. Be like Mega Clop. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I am going to need more in if I lose any more. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. All we'll right. See. Okay. Well, listen. Thank you guys as always uh, for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. Take it easy. We'll have more for you later in the week, and we will catch you on the next one. Bye bye.